Uh, Justin Botier, CEO of Calix CPA. Jamie is my, my business partner, tax extraordinaire. And then, of course, we've got Nick Richards, the esteemed, very popular uh, tax attorney. Nick Richards joining us. Thank you. Um, so, so actually, I think it was Jamie or my idea to, that we need to do a continued education. We need to get the cannabis accounting community together because we're kind of on like this tail end of, of 280E. I think we're thinking maybe next year, mid to late next year, uh, when cannabis ultimately gets rescheduled to Schedule 3, 280E is no longer an issue. I imagine almost everybody here by now knows what 280E is, I hope. And so this is definitely like a 301 or 401 level college course, but it's a lot less about maybe educating you and more like just stating the facts because I think at this point, um, we need to do something. <laughs> and we need to give our clients the facts and then let them make a decision about whether or not they want to take the risk of being aggressive with 280E. And so we put together a slide deck, which I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn on here pretty soon. And it kind of goes over the tools that we use now to mitigate 280E. It also goes over the various constitution, whether or not the Controlled Substances Act is constitutional. And that's why Nick, thank you, Nick, for joining us, because I'm hoping that Nick can speak on that. Um, and so I guess what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and start this. Let's see, share presentation. Uh, we put this together. So, so Jamie and I put together quite a bit of material so that you guys can download this and it can be found, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it can be found at, uh, at handouts up at the top right. And in there is a slide deck um, so that you can download these slides uh, and, and view them for yourself. But I mean, what it is, is it's just kind of a comprehensive uh, presentation about all of the tools that the cannabis industry has to move forward with potentially challenging 280E. And so, um, and that's, you know, and that's what, that's what we, what I think we want to happen because here at Calix, we're pretty aggressive. We've been aggressive with our use of 471C. We are giving our clients the option to move forward without reducing deductions for 280E. And we're even uh, giving our clients the option of amending returns, tax returns. Uh, and so, but we don't wanna be alone in this. And that's really what the point of this presentation is, is that we don't, we don't wanna be in a very small minority of people who are willing to give our clients the option to do this. And the approaches that we have are defensible. Uh, we, we, we don't know what the risk is, but we have to assume that it's high because I don't know, we don't know what it is. We've never been, you know, our use of 471C has never been challenged. Our, uh, you know, we just recently started amending tax returns to not reduce uh, deductions. We're moving forward without reducing deductions. We don't know what the risk is, the IRS will definitely give you the impression that the risk is very high because there's, I constantly see articles about like attorneys saying, no, it's the worst thing that you could ever do. Uh, and then of course, IRS agents saying, hey, we're gonna go after you. Okay, so what the facts are, I don't know, but today I'm hoping just to, just to, to uh, introduce the facts, all right? So with that said, let's, let's move forward with this this presentation. So a lot of this presentation is kind of the background. We don't need to let you know what the Controlled Substances Act is, I hope, because that's, I mean, essentially it's, uh, it is what uh, has uh, created, it is what makes cannabis a Schedule One drug and, and makes 280U applicable. Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip ahead. Now these are, this is slide decks available for you so you can download it. And you can and uh, you can uh, peruse it for your entertainment at a future date. But uh, 
So let's start here. Um, it's interesting, we've come full circle here because I remember, and the reason why we cho chose uh, uh, Tax Pros, John Sheely's organization, is because I remember the first continuing education I went to was about 10 years ago, and it was in person in Denver with, uh, with John Sheely. And, uh, and at that time, it was very interesting because I went there, I flew there, and when I got there, the education was pretty much, this is 280E and you're screwed. That was the, that was the, <laughs> that was the information that I got. And at that time, Oregon was just uh, rolling out its medical dispensaries. And so, so when I started doing tax returns and applying 280E, I'm like, wow, this is, this is insane. There is no way that this is real. 90% effective tax rate, there's no way that these dispensaries are going to be able to survive at that, at that point. But what was nice about this Denver uh, continuing education is that I was in a room with other, uh, with other accountants from California and Colorado and Washington, and they had been exploring this. And we, we, we jumped on 263A, which as you know, by now that we don't use it because in, in the code, it says that if deductions are otherwise disallowed by another code section, we're not, we can't, we can't use 263A. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie or, or Nick, if I say anything uh, that's incorrect. But what we then did was we landed on 471A uh, and, and in it, we, you know, we were able to kind of like go like, Hey, well, if we, if we allocate expenses, you know, if if the payroll, if the peop, the staff are pack, packaging and bagging and weighing in the back and doing inventory handling, well, that payroll is deductible. And when, when they're up front, then then that you know that payroll is not deductible. And then we were doing these complex like uh, uh, square footage. Uh, maps and saying, okay, this square footage is not deductible. That square footage is deductible. And then, and then the tax returns were bonkers complicated, <laughs> but that's what we had to do. And whether or not it was defensible, that was up in the air because I read plenty of articles that said, well, this is for, this is a retail business, not a manufacturing business. So were we even doing it right at all? But Ultimately, I had a I had a, a tax return that was challenged to 471A. We used 471A. It was challenged, and ultimately, they were like the IRS is like, well, what what is a reasonable cost of goods sold? And and they gave and they gave us some of it, right? They didn't they didn't totally. It wasn't a bloodbath. They just said like, hey, we're gonna we'll meet you in the middle. We think you took too much, but we're not gonna like shut you down. But even then, it was an outrageous tax rate, 76, 60, 70%. And it was only until 2018 when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed where they, they passed 471C. So let's see here. Um, and I'm going to actually, I've talked a lot already, and thank you for listening. But um, Jamie, do you want to talk a little bit about 471C? Sure, yeah. Uh, so 471C was, you know, an additional section of the code and specifically um, inventory like valuation methodologies that are allowable um, on tax returns. And this was the intention of 471C was really simplification. Um, it's for businesses that are considered small businesses, which are actually quite large <laughs> to the average Joe. Right. So I think it started at 26 million. Um average revenue over the past three years and and it's it's been adjusted to about 29 million now so um any business you know with 29 million or less in revenue is eligible you know to use 471c to value their inventory and and in short it's a very short code section but like you know in short it basically says if your books and records match what you report on the tax return it's an acceptable um methodology for valuing inventory, which is way different than what we were dealing with before, which was very specific, uh, very not expansive <laughs> inventory accounting rules, and especially limited for retailers, where the code really said, the code along with the regulations that interpret the code really said, retailers can only take 
your direct cost of product and, you know, maybe shipping costs. Um, as Justin mentioned, there was kind of a reasonability, reasonableness kind of applied to that. And really the IRS was kind of allowing, you know, certain reasonable allocations of payroll, some other items and costs of it sold, but really it wasn't, you know, supported by regulation. Um, so this was a huge opportunity. The accountants in the cannabis industry saw 471C as a huge opportunity. They, you know, reading it, there is a lot of talk about, oh, wow, we could just on our books, we could say, let's put everything in cost of goods sold. We'll call everything cost of goods sold. Um, and, and no 280E will apply anymore. You know, this is the end of 280E. And, you know, that's a pretty aggressive interpretation of it. But, you know, I think in a way it could be argued. Um, shortly after, you know, I don't remember the exact timeline. Shortly after that was released and, you know. It was 2021 or, 21. You know. Yeah. Uh, Nick. Uh, Nick. Oh, you're oh, muted. You're muted. Nick. I think you're muted. Can I inter interrupt real quick and just give a little bit of lawyer lawyer piece on 471 C? Yes, so some important things to understand about 471 C. Um, when we talk about full absorption accounting and the 471 A regulations, right? Those are regulations. Those are methods. 471 C is the law. Right. And so if you're out there going, wait a minute, what they're saying conflicts with gap or conflicts with full absorption accounting. Guess what? You lose because 471 C <laughs> is the law mm -hmm. and the regulations are a lesser authority to the law. That's really, really, really important to understand right. because 471 C is this remarkably crazy code section that says some things that when we have our accounting 471A hat on, don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But look, 471C, I'll use the word, trumps 471A. <laughs> and here's why. The first thing that 471C is, says is that 471A doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that's really important because it says, it says that the 471A law, the regulations, full absorption accounting, all of that stuff, does not apply by law. That's right. really, really, really important to understand. You got to take off your, your full absorption counting hat. You got to take off your 263 cap A hat because none of those rules apply under 471C, okay? And it's really important to understand that. I'll stop there. Well, and the reason why, and the reason why this is important is because when we were using this, you know, when, it, when 471C passed and Nick, thank you so much for, being like introducing to this to us properly we started using 471c and our office and i'm going to just spill the beans here was taking 100 percent of payroll 100 percent of facility costs all other costs that were related to the transactions that were you know the costs that were required to transact uh you know make transactions in dispensaries we were taking all of it and and here and here's the thing about it is like you were saying nick that 471c's rules are very clear as long as it is in conformance with the books and records of the of the business as long as your inventory methodology is you know you have a reasonable inventory methodology and i saw there was a lot of people who were taking 100 percent, and i think that's what ultimately cause the IRS to step in and say like, Hey, we need to, to close this loophole, which I think you spoke on Nick, that they did try to do that, but that's not tax code, right? It doesn't so, say yeah. Yeah, Justin, what they did is, yeah. so there was this TIGTA report that came out yes, and, uh -huh. and that TIGTA report sort of said, Hey, IRS 471 C is pretty dramatic. These people are saying it can eliminate 280E. Why don't you issue some regulations on the mm -hmm. interplay of 280E and 471C. And then I see your regulation slide up there, up, up there, right? Those regular when those regulations came out, guess what they didn't mention? 280E, right? Nowhere do they mention 280E. Yeah. So that was quite dramatic mm -hmm. to see TIGTA tell the IRS to do this. And then when the IRS did it, it didn't, it didn't reference 280E. And that was fairly remarkable uh, when taken in context yeah. of what. 
471C says, right? Right, right. But, and they sort of tried to, it seems like they tried to imply it, right, without actually saying it. And that it's kind of the theme we've been getting from the IRS the last several years is they're like implying it's not allowed without actually really saying it. So as we kind of mentioned here in the slides, the wording is like, if, you know, for a cost that would otherwise be non-deductible or non-recoverable, um, you know, you can't use 471C to, you know, transform it into an inventory cost that's eventually deductible as cost of sold. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Nick has put out um, several great um, CPEs or webinars on, mm -hmm. on his position about whether, um, you know, disallowed costs are otherwise recoverable. Um, we won't go into that too much, but either yeah. way, I think it's really, it's just really interesting. So they issued this, they sort of tried to imply it won't work, you know, for cannabis and mm -hmm. cannabis industry without specifically saying it. And, um, there's multiple ways you can argue that 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 the regulation doesn't really apply here. Um, but one one argument is a kind of as as Nick mentioned is just that the IRS doesn't have the authority to just contradict the code, right? And um, so regulations have um, a lower authority than the code. And so we can look to the code, which is very simple and says you know 471A does not apply, and we are able to to use an inventory me methodology, you know, on the tax return that just matches our books and records. Justin, did you want to chime in? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I just, I, the point, the really, I mean, 471C should not be new to most people <laughs> at this point, because the fire is almost out, you know, and so 471, the real benefits of 471C was like over the last four or five years, right? So, um, now, but the reason why I want to, I'm the reason why we're going over this is because a, it's still a viable option for the next couple of years. We still want want people to use it, but um, at that time, the we were getting so much like, hey, you're putting your clients at risk. You, it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when you get audited. You're gonna, it's gonna be very costly with lots of penalties, and um, knock on wood, knock on wood it that has not happened and and nick i wanted to talk to you just a little bit ask your questions too maybe we should have asked this beforehand but have you seen um the fallout of the use of 471c has there been significant have the, has the irs been punitive with companies that have used 471c have they attacked those cannabis companies and 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 has it cost us greatly and that's a slightly rhetorical question, because, but, but I don't know. You might surprise me. Well, so first off, I don't file tax returns, um, and and so I'm gonna I'm gonna say first what I hear from a lot of the CPA yes. partners that I work That's with. What we want to know, and and what I'm hearing is that hey, look, we haven't had any audits of 471c taxpayers. In fact, I've heard some of them say, look. It seems to us that we're still getting audits of our non 471c taxpayers, but not our 471c taxpayers. Mm -hmm. um, so I've heard that from a number of CPAs out there. Um, I, I, and, and, you know, why might that be? Again, it it takes the IRS. I didn't say this, though. What 471c does, is it takes the IRS's power away. Because what 471A says is that the IRS shall determine cost of goods sold so to clearly reflect income. So when 471C says 471A doesn't apply, it takes that power away from the IRS. It also gives the taxpayer a very key power because what it says is your books and records have to match your tax return. And if they do, that it, quote, shall not fail to clearly reflect income. That's the end of the story. <laughs> that's that's our income tax system, right? Once you clearly reflect income, the tax is applied, right? There's nothing else to talk about once income is clearly reflected. So it really takes the IRS's power away in a big, big, big way. And and for that reason, maybe we understand why they don't seem to be wanting to audit 471C taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, I have had some. Um, the main thing I do is is handle audits and, and tax trials and tax debt and all that kind of stuff. That's why I 
I'm an expert in 280E because there is no regulations on 280E, right? And I've had mm -hmm. hundreds of 280E audits that I've handled. Some of them have been 471C audits. And, and really kind of what happened is that, you know, the IRS targeted the cannabis industry and they built all these audits. And then they cherry picked all the big good ones. And then COVID hit. And then they're like, God, what do we do now? We don't have anything to do. Well, what about that list? Let's go back to that. And then they did all the rest of them. And in the rest of them, there was some small businesses that got passed over in the first time, but then they picked up and lo and behold, there was 471C. And so yeah. I think I had about six of them, I want to say. Um, and what I have found, I think I've got three no changes of those six and three that the IRS wanted to challenge. And what we found was that if the books and records were good, we got no changes. If they weren't, we got a challenge. Uh, and then we, and then as Justin said, then we backed into the, yeah, let's be reasonable. And we settled those cases, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, we don't have any law enforcement. c and the no changes that I've received, they're not, they're not binding legal precedent or anything like that. Yeah. But Justin, to answer your question, doesn't seem like the IRS wants to go after 471c taxpayers. Mm -hmm. so right about the same time the 471c came out, I think the IRS made, made it known that it was going to only audit larger businesses over 25 million. Strange coincidence there? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, that's where we are today. And, and Nick, that's, that's um, really great insight. And uh, I just wanted to add, you know, from a practical standpoint, as we've been, as our firm, Calix, has been preparing tax returns using 471C, since those final regulations were issued that some say, you know, would dis, would maybe disallow the cannabis industry from using 471C, we've been filing um, disclosures with every tax return that we file. And um, I don't know if, if the attendees are familiar with the different kinds of disclosures, but there's um, a general disclosure called the 8275, and then there's um, an 8275R, and the R stands for regulation. And it, and it, it basically is telling the IRS that you're specifically taking a position contrary to um, the reg regulations that it has, you know, uh, published. So we have filed every single tax return that we've prepared hundreds. I don't even know how many, Justin, um, so many using 471C and everyone has included this 8275R. And so there's a lot of talk, you know, people often ask me, what's a red flag? Is this a red flag for an audit? Is this a red flag? And I, you know, can basically never answer yes. Like nothing, I, I don't think it's clear what is or is not a red flag, but I can give some insight into certain things. Um, an 8275R is absolutely a red flag. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's probably like the only, at least in my experience, one of the only things I can say, surefire red flag for an audit, because you're telling the IRS you're specifically um, taking a position contrary to, to what they believe is the correct position, essentially. Um, and so that just really speaks to that um, that idea that the IRS does not want to audit those returns. I mean, we've been we've been almost it feels like our firm has been begging them <laughs> to audit us almost with the number of 8275Rs that we filed. Um, and we have not seen uh, any audits yet of those returns. So really interesting. And Jamie, let me add one more thing. You know, the position has gotten stronger this year mm -hmm. with the overruling of Chevron, right? right. Well, Chevron is a case that has said, basically, we'll let the IRS say what they think 471C mm -hmm. means, if, if it came to that, right? Mm -hmm. Now that Chevron's gone, the IRS doesn't have the authority anymore to sort of reinterpret the re the law, right? And if there's a direct contradiction, which there appears to be here, the IRS is going to lose without Chevron in, 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 in quite a significant way. And so, you know, even we started doing this three years ago, right? And it's gotten even better in the last year with the overruling of Chevron. So it's quite right. interesting. It's quite exactly. interesting how this, this road has gone for us. Can I ask you a question, uh, Nick? And first, first of all, yeah, there was that 80, 8275. Oh, Jamie disappeared, was always uh, a request, an 8275R was a request to be audited. I love that when people would tell me that. Um, but uh, shoot, I just forgot what I was going to ask, but I, it's going to come to me. Um, okay, so I have a question because we always disallow, we do disallow like discretionary spending kind of things, advertising, professional fees, interest most of the time, insurance, some of those kinds of things. I mean, we would 
we, we deduct a lot. We deduct a lot, but we always were really good about throwing the IRS a bone and saying like, Hey, we won't deduct advertising. We won't deduct these things. Cause they're not, you know, they're not like instrumental to, to transact actions, but there was a lot of people for a while that were putting a hundred percent of everything into uh, their inventory calculation for 71 C methodology, everything a hundred percent. And then just recently I was looking at a couple of tax returns from new clients of ours. And there's a, a company, a pretty well known cannabis company that's putting all of it's the first time I'm seeing them use for 71 C, but they are now putting all of the, the, the costs into inventory. So my question is, are we safe now potentially for at least the upcoming tax season next year for 2024 to include all, all expenses into inventory? I, is Thank that you. a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of. I'm not going to talk about whether we're safe or not. But I'll tell you no, no, no. I'll tell you what the 2023, how the, uh, an additional way that 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 the the position got stronger in 2023 okay yeah and this is a little bit of what we're going to talk about with race and the amendment yeah, we're going to definitely well. get into all of that i'm not going to uh, um, this is a little bit of a part of it but this is really a 23 go forward method whereas yeah. the race challenge is more go back and file amendment returns yes exactly so, so a very interesting thing happened in 2023 we got the hhs report and recommendation to reschedule to schedule three, right? That was leaked in 2023. Um, later this year, this year in April, right? We got the, the proposed regulations issued by the Department of Justice along, and those included the HHS report in them. And we also got an, an opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel as well. All three of those were released. If you go on to doj.gov, they're all sitting there, or dea.gov. Um, so, why is that significant? So first off, that Office of Legal Counsel advisory opinion, right? The, the, the government needed that because we had these treaties out there and there's all this talk about how rescheduling would violate treaties. And there was also the 2016 determination by the DEA not to reschedule marijuana, right? And so the Department of Justice wanted some, some advice around that, right? And, and of course, the advice was the treaties are okay, don't worry about that. Um, and the two two things, the 2016 determination not to reschedule cannabis was based upon the wrong test, right? One of the basic big things about a Schedule One drug is it's a dangerous drug that, you know, blah, 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 that doesn't have a currently accepted medical use. Really, yeah. the only difference between Schedules Two and Schedule One is a currently accepted medical use, right? And so the test that they, the DEA used in 2016, according to the Office of Legal Counsel, was wrong. It was impermissibly narrow. And when they used the right test, there was a currently accepted medical use, and cannabis was re, is re, now proposed to be rescheduled to Schedule Three, right? So that's really quite interesting, right? That they they fucked up back then, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And really, you know, reading into that a little bit, they were wrong, right? That was the wrong result back into 2016, right? Um, so what else? So the other thing they said was that the that the that the opinion of the Department of Health and Human Services was binding until the regulation, the proposed regulations, were released. And then it has, in, in legal terms, substantial deference, meaning it's a big evidentiary mountain that's hard to overcome, right? Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is, after all, the government's own internal report on marijuana, right? And so that, is, that has a lot of weight against the government. It'd be hard for the government to get around that, right? Um, so 280E, right? What that report says is that marijuana doesn't meet the definition of a schedule one or schedule two drug, right? It meets the definition of a schedule three drug. Mm -hmm. 280E does not say it ap applies to substances that are scheduled as a schedule one or schedule two drug. It says it applies to substances that fall within the definition of a schedule one or schedule two drug. In 2023, the US government said that marijuana doesn't fall within the definition of a schedule one or schedule two drug. Mm -hmm. Interesting. No. 
right? I, so that's been my question all along. Oh, Why in the right, hell so, it ever so been are people more? just putting it all in there now? Maybe that, and you ask me, is that safe? Is that justified? That would be my argument that I would use mm -hmm. to say that beginning in 2023, mm -hmm. 280E no longer applied, and under 471C, we can now put it all into cost of goods or perhaps just report it as a normal business, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's 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 that argument. It's quite compelling, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, you look at look at what 280E says. It doesn't say a scheduled substance. It says Falling in the, the definition, right? Yeah, well, it, really and, and that, and that, so that report was issued August of 2023, right? Um, and so, does it apply to all of 23, or does it just apply 24 moving forward? Those are some questions that we have. It's very interesting, Justin. It's very interesting that uh, Jamie, you probably saw this that 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 notice that was issued about a month and a half ago that warned the industry about filing amended returns. Guess what? It didn't say. Right. It said, hey, the, the idea that rescheduling is retroactive and you can file a minimum returns and ask for your money back. That's wrong. It didn't say anything about 2023. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Right. right? It's oftentimes it said, more interesting. It what does it yeah, I think it said 280 still applies and marijuana has it was it was it was very strategically worded, in my opinion, mm -hmm. where it said, you know, marijuana hasn't we're reminding taxpayers marijuana has not yet been rescheduled. 280 still applies. Um, but it really didn't speak to the actual argument that like it should not apply. You know, it's saying, you know, mm -hmm. if people are filing returns, just assuming like misinterpreting the proposed rescheduling as actual rescheduling. That was kind of the interpretation. Justin, well, as being, as being retroactive. Right. Yeah. That was that was it's not retroactive. It's not retroactive. Right. right? right. Um, and yeah. then, of course, Justin always likes to argue, too. You know, if we find out now it doesn't fall, you know, it doesn't fall within the meaning of a schedule one or a schedule two drug, it really never should have. Right. So that is something, Justin, just from a common sense standpoint, maybe not as good of a legal argument, maybe not as good of like an accounting argument, but really from a common sense standpoint, if we realize we messed it up, it never should have been classified this way. Right. And so, you know, that's part of kind of the, the mindset that, that gets us into, should we go ahead and amend? Should we argue um, right. I think a lot of people can agree that it's at least reasonable that 280E should not have been applying. So all these years, right? So do we go ahead and take that risk? Do we argue it um, and see if the IRS is really willing to fight us on it? Um, they say they don't agree with the position and we know that, right? Like we don't need them to say that. We know they don't agree with the position. Um, our position is that we disagree with it. Like we disagree with them. Um, so we're ready to fight kind of is, is where we're coming from. So it, it'll be interesting to see if they do actually, uh, you know, audit and then challenge these actual real legal arguments that are saying we don't believe it should apply, even though technically the law is written that way right now. And, and that was why, Jamie, that was why I started out with the, 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 the Office of Legal Counsel saying that 2016 mm -hmm. determination was, was based on the wrong test. Right, Justin, that that is your support mm -hmm. for your for your argument that we should be able to go back, right? If that's your argument, but I think that's quite compelling actually. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of other stuff out there as well that you could put your fingers on that shows that it was wrong. And interestingly, if you read that, those proposed regulations, what they say is that the DEA wouldn't act, right? And so the, and so the DOJ has to go around the DA or DA works for the DOJ, right? As part of the DOJ. Mm -hmm. But they say basically, yeah, DA didn't, they wouldn't move, so we're doing it. Well, guess who else wouldn't move? The IRS, right? The whole, the whole federal government took a hands-off approach, except for the IRS, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we need DOJ yeah. to move on the IRS too, right? Maybe that's the basis of this retroactive um, push uh, and request that the industry is making, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's something there. I think it's a way long shot, but I think there's something there. I like two th I like August 2023 20, though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And and then Marijuana Moment, which is a great publication for people who may not be subscribed to their uh, news articles, uh, put out uh, an article finding uh, somebody found uh, audio recordings of Nixon. Now, I don't know if it's AI right. generated. I trust this publication. 
but AI is so crazy. You could do anything with it and you can put words in anybody's mouth in history, in overall history. But um, he pretty much was saying like, hey, marijuana, he was saying, I don't know if marijuana should be included as a schedule one drug. He was saying, I don't see it's that dangerous. That's what he was saying in that. And then, but the, the, the group that he was working with, his council was like, now nah, we need to, we need to eradicate this from our great nation. Right. Uh, and so, so they threw it in there. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, if, if, if the HHS and these other organizations are like, Hey, no, this is, this should, this shouldn't be a schedule one drug. Then the federal government has done immense damage to people, to this industry, immense, you know, the amount of money that was sunk and lost into this because of this issue. And it just seems like everybody else was hands off, just like you were saying, federal government's like, hey, you know, you just do your own thing in your own state and we'll leave you alone. But not the IRS. <laughs> the IRS is all over you, right? So anyway, let's move on because we've definitely uh, went to the next uh, to the ne to the next part of this conversation, which um, is uh moving f the reasonable basis argument do we have a reasonable basis for moving forward without reducing deductions uh reducing deduction for 280e and do we have potentially a reasonable basis for going back and amending returns along with our other uh larger you know industry leaders blaze tra trailblazers uh true leave and cure leaf and ascend and these other uh, large corporations that are amending their returns, truly have got their money, um, and moving forward without, without reducing deductions for 280E. I'll, I'll pass, pass it over to you, uh, Nick, if you want to take the lead on this. Yeah, so, you know, it all started maybe three, three years ago or so when the Supreme Court denied cert on a case called Standing Akimbo. And um, Justice Thomas took the opportunity to say that Gonzales v. Raich may no longer be good law because the facts have changed. So Gonzales v. Raich is a 2005 U.S. Supreme Court case um, that basically held that because the federal government had an interstate policy of eliminating marijuana from the United States, Justice Thomas called it a watertight policy, um, that because of that was this overall interstate policy and goal that it was justified in preventing an intrastate in, in maintaining illegal effects, Schedule 1, on cannabis intrastate commercial activity, right? Um, there is no federal right to regulate drugs. And the U.S. Constitution states that any power not specifically given to the federal government is reserved for the states. And the only way the federal government has the right to regulate drugs is through the interstate commerce clause. So the question is, do that, does that interstate authority allow them to regulate intrastate activity? Because as you all know, our industry is not interstate, it's intrastate, right? Um, so Justice Thomas said, hey, look, the facts have changed. That started this process, this, 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 this very large, very prominent litigation firm called Boy Schiller Flexner start, approached the cannabis industry and got involved in some of the high level groups that were out there and said, look, you guys need to fund us to bring a case to challenge Gonzalez v. Raich. That happened. That's a case called Canna Provisions. It was filed uh, in the fall of last year, right about the same time as when True Leave made their announcement. Um, and Canna Provisions is directly challenging the, the, the Gonzales v. Raich and the federal government's ability to regulate marijuana under the, under the Controlled Substances Act, right? So the argument goes like this. Again, the basis of the, it, it, it's, it's sort of remarkable, right, for the federal government to infringe upon a state's intrastate authority, right? The Constitution doesn't say they can do that, right? So there has to be a good reason, right? There needs to be some you know, good reason. In 2005, you remember, they were locking people up in California and Oregon and, and elsewhere, right? Um, and so they were maintaining this watertight policy of illeg illegality, right? Now, 20 years later, there is no watertight policy, right? As we well know, the federal government has its hands-off approach, everybody but the IRS, right? 
Um, and that is seen through various pieces of evidence. For example, the Rohrbacher Farr amendments, right? Defund the Department of Justice for enforcing the CSA against a state legal cannabis company. The Cole memos, right? Say, hey, we're going to take a hands off approach. The authorization of Washington, D.C.'s program, right? All of those things happened very early on. I think the first Cole memo was 2014. Um, and I, that might be the Rohrbach, first Rohrbach or Farr Amendment as well, right? So those go way, way back, right? More recently, some other things have happened. The hemp industry, right? The carve out of hemp from the Controlled Substances Act has created a huge industry where you could buy legal THC products in convenience stores across the country. As a matter of fact, what I read in MJ Biz was that every state but two you can now buy legal THC products and the hemp THC products are oftentimes stronger than what's allowed in the state regulated system, right? So the, the, the dynamic has changed super dramatically. And then of course, now we have the HHS report as well, right? Um, and so so the can back to what's going on in the courts right now, the can of provisions case now, when they filed that case, they challenged Gonzalez v. Raich. They raised this change in facts. And the federal government responded with a motion to dismiss and said, hey, look, first off, you're right. The Controlled Substances Act isn't being enforced. And so for that reason, guess what? You have no damages. So you can't do us. Number two, Gonzalez v. Raich is binding Supreme Court precedent. And the district court can't overrule the Supreme Court. So you got to grant our dismissal. So there was argue there was, you know, back and forth on that and the oral argument and all that kind of stuff. And about right about the time, right, almost the same day that the IRS released their warning uh, at, uh, uh, publication. Right. The, the opinion came out from the court. And what the court said is there is standing you, because you do have the potential for damages. Number two. Gonzalez v. Raich is, you're right, it's binding Supreme Court precedent. We can't overturn the Supreme Court, so we have to dismiss your case. You're right. But the court also went out of its way to say that the arguments were, quote, persuasive. That was a big deal, right? Um, persuasive is a got to be higher than reasonable basis, right? <laughs> um, I don't think it's a technical tax opinion term, but it feels better to me. Right. So yeah. that all happened. Right. So that there's something there, right. That, that it's not, we're not there yet. Well, that, that case will be in the appeals court by the end of the year. Um, it'll probably be in the U S Supreme court by this, by the end of next year. Um, and um, look, the, it, it, it is a compelling argument. Um, and let me say one more thing. There was a recent, this whole, those of you out there, lawyers, I'm sure there's a few of you might remember this case called Wickard v. Filburn from law school. It's a weird case. Basically, it gives the federal government the right to stop farmers from growing wheat for their own personal home consumption. Because if every farmer went out and did that, nobody would go to the store and buy Wonder Bread. And that would affect interstate commerce, right? It is a case that the, that the conservative court hates. And if you Google Wickard v. Filburn, you'll see all kinds of conservative think tanks writing opinions about how it's the worst thing that's ever happened to our country. <laughs> it, is the, it, is the opinion, it, is the, it is the Supreme Court opinion that Gonzales v. Raich is based upon, um, specifically. And the court is now not following Wickard v. Filburn. And just like in the Controlled Substances Act, there is no federal right to regulate the environment. The only way the federal government gets to regulate the environment is through the Interstate Commerce Clause, right? And the Interstate Commerce Clause also applies to the avenues of interstate commerce, things like interstate rivers, right? And so there's a case from last year called Sackett. In, in, and in the Environmental Clean Water Act, think of that farmer with that wetland way out there in the middle of nowhere, right? That farmer wants to fill that wetland in and build some homes, right? A lot more money there. But guess what? The federal government goes, no, no, those are navigable waters of the of the U.S. And for that reason, we have jurisdiction under the Interstate Commerce Clause and, and under the under the Clean Water Act. We're going to say no. Um, so they went to court on that. And, you know, the, there's been a lot of cases on that. And the, and the farmer always loses. As a matter of fact, I think they've gotten up to sort of 12 miles away from any interstate waterway because underground all the water's connected right and so look if you if every farmer fills in their wetland you know that'll affect this waterway right because it's all connected underground so the court and that's based on wickard v filburn the court didn't go there what the court said is we don't care what's underground we don't care what we can't see if we can't see a connection if there's no surface water connection if i can't get in my canoe 
and paddle from the from the wetland to the river, there is no interstate commerce jurisdiction. Hmm. Hmm. There is no so there, there has to be a direct, visible surface water connection. We don't have that in cannabis, right? There is no direct interstate. Justin, connection. you're muted. Right. So that's that that is a great case showing the direction in which the Supreme Court is going and how it might rule if it again got to got to consider. Yeah. And we only have 10 minutes and we've got 24 slides. <laughs> but uh, on the on the screen now is is kind of what you're saying is if if this when it gets to the back to the Supreme Court, you think that the Supreme Court will rule in the favor of the plaintiff versus what happened in uh, in 2005 uh, with Gonzalez versus Reich. Would you say I think that? there's a reasonable basis to conclude. There's a reasonable basis to conclude. Exactly. So I'm going to I'm going to burn through these slides. And again, these are available to you. Mm -hmm. and, it, and the list just goes on and on, you know, really. So um, there's some other constitutional, uh, the fight is, there's some other, do you want to speak briefly on this, Nick? 16th. Yeah, let me just say on the 16th Amendment, right, that's an argument that's been out there for a while. I'm sure you all looked at it. It got all the way up to the Ninth Circuit in a case called Harborside, and the Ninth Circuit said, up, oh, it's not an issue. We're not going to talk about it. Um, so it's still a live issue as well. It's still and the real question is, does, 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 is 280 constitutional under the 16th Amendment? because it taxes more than gain realized, right? Um, simple example, you know, if I have a joint, I buy it for $2, I pay Justin, my bud tender $2 to sell, he sells it for $5. I only made a dollar, but I get taxed on $3. Um, and is that gain realized, right? Um, and so that's the 16th Amendment argument. Last, uh, just real, real recently, about two months ago, we got a decision in a case called Moore, M-O-O-R-E. Moore involved, the TCJA to, to take care of all these uh, tax breaks that, that the cannabis industry got from 471C, the federal government had to find a revenue somewhere, right? And so the, what the TCJA says is that the federal government can deem um, a taxable event for U.S. owners of undistributed foreign corporation income. Basically, if you're a U.S. owner of a foreign company, foreign corporation, and it's holding income and not distributing it to you, we can deem you uh, uh, the recipient of flow through income for tax purposes, right? Yeah. It sounds like there's no gain realized there, right? So that was the challenge to the court. And, and, you know, this violates the 16th Amendment. The majority opinion punted. They had, The majority opinion assumed that gain was realized because it was realized by the corporation, right? And the only question was once there is gain realized, can we attribute it to an individual owner rather than a company? And the answer is, yeah, we can... We can attribute it to anybody we want at that point. But interestingly, four Supreme Court justices wrote separate opinions specifically saying that gain and realization was required. Right? They went out of their way. They didn't have to do that. Two of them were concurring opinions. And even though they agreed that it could be attributed, they went out of the way and they said, we're disappointed we didn't address this point because it's really important and it's required. And then two justices dissented, right? So that's four of nine saying it's required. Meanwhile, only one justice said it wasn't required. The other four assumed it was already satisfied, right? So that's, that's a big deal in the 16th Amendment argument. Mm -hmm. So, so the list goes on, right? <laughs> um, and, and so I'm just going to go through again, like people can download these slides. We've uh, put links to, to stuff in there. We talk about the, you know, the companies pushing back. It's, this is even outdated. I think they're, you know, as far as like what's been going on. Um, I want to get to statute of limitations and those kinds of things. Like, what are we, what are we doing now? Like, and, and again, we're, we at Calix are not looking for anything here. We're, I mean, we're not looking to benefit from this except for encouraging other accountants to finally advocate to their clients if you have not started doing so already. Not because you're afraid of, of uh, punitive, uh, you know, punitive, punitive damages that the IRS may impose on, on your clients and you, right? And, and again, we encourage 8275 to to argue your you know put your reasonable basis in there to to not do reduce deductions 
we encourage you to make sure you use an 8275 if you're gonna use a 471C approach. Um, okay, so we're getting there. We're getting Let me there. chime in for a second. I'll chime in for yeah. a second and say, we, we may not have time to go over it, but we did include an example of a tax return that uses 471C, um, it includes uh, 3115. So I wanna just touch to some of the technical aspects of it. Um, right. To use 471C, if your client has not previously used it, you have to file a 3115 change in accounting method for it to be valid. Um, and you need to do that with a timely tax return uh, for the year that you're wanting to change that method. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really important piece because it's a very easy way to invalidate a method if you don't do that. And then that's, you know, an easy argument to say, oh, you can't use 471C. You might get audited. It's not that 471C doesn't work, but it's that you didn't, you didn't correctly ask to change your accounting method. So we've yeah. got an example 3115 in there. Um, we've got the 8275R that we file. And I have, I've included some references in there to try to kind of guide you guys through the various aspects of the return that are important. Um, and, um, and I've also included um, an Excel template that we use. So one question we got asked here in the Q&A is about whether or not you have to actually even capitalize any inventory under 471C. And I think it's a great question. I think that you could probably argue, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure you could argue, I'm sure Nick could argue, that you don't need to have an inventory balance because you know your books and records that that's how you value it you don't track it you know but you do call it all cost of goods sold we have always taken an aggressive approach in that we take a hundred percent of facility costs a hundred percent of payroll costs um, for simplicity purposes but we do also try to make it a stronger position by including a portion of those costs in inventory um, and the way we do that is we take um, at, our, you know, there's different ways to do it, but the way that we do it is we take like an actual direct inventory balance that the client can provide us of actual product on hand at year end. And we, and we come up with a percentage. So we take that, we take it over their total purchases for the whole year to get a percentage, say like there's 10% on hand out of the total purchases in the year. And we apply that same percentage to all the indirect costs that we're including um, in cost of goods sold, just to try to make our position a little stronger, really have it running through inventory, um, and then ultimately becoming cost of goods sold. Cause cost of goods sold really is a calculated figure uh, based on inventory, right? It's not meant to be, um, you know, just its own thing. It's supposed to be calculated. So I've included an Excel spreadsheet that we use, um, that kind of, you can plug in your numbers, um, and get those get those, uh, those different numbers, indirect inventory, direct inventory. Um, and you can see on that tax return how it kind of flows. You know, the 1125A um, ties to the 8275R, which ties to that Excel spreadsheet. Um, like I said, unfortunately, we won't have enough time to really go over it in depth, but hopefully you guys can take some time to look at that. Um, we've found that in a lot of the CPE we've taken, there's rarely ever actually an example of how to prepare these returns. And so we're really hoping to provide that so that more people who, you know, maybe want to move forward with this approach, but are kind of unsure how it actually looks can, can try to do it. Yeah. Um, so go ahead, Justin, you can, you can take that over. Well, just do the, I mean, do the best that you can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, we've been doing it for a long time and it wasn't super clean at the very beginning. Right. But but we, it's it's just something we've re refined over time uh, every tax year, every tax season. But we're definitely entering a new level right now. And really, it's a lot less about the 471C approach that should have been people should have been doing that a long time ago, but they got scared, you know, and that's. And that's really what's super unfortunate. I'm just now seeing clients who've been screwed over year after year after year. Their, their accountants have now started taking a 471C approach and the fire is like out on 471C, right? 471C is now the conservative approach. So um, now we're talking about amending tax returns or moving forward without use, deducting for 280E. And we feel like very similar to the way it was back when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed and Nick was talking about 471C and we, we were on board for sure. 
Um, but we got a lot of the, the IRS was trying to scare the shit out of us. And, and most of us were scared and we were scared too, but we did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. So here we are uh, now we have the possibility of amending returns and, and reclaiming all these lost deductions. Um, so the statute of limitations right now is three years. So the, for a timely filed and paid corporate return, the statute of limitations is October 15th, if, if an extension was filed to it, you know? Uh, and so that, that's, that time is running out right now. We've, we've only got three weeks and we're all super busy right now with the fi filing the, the personal and the corporate tax returns right now. Who is the time to go and do this, right? So um, protective claim for refund. Now reach out to, to Nick. Um, Nick, I hope, I hope you don't mind me plugging you, but we, we worked with Nick for a reasonable fee. He gave us what we needed to get a protective, to, to argue reasonable basis in like legal terms, legal leads. Uh, and we, and we have done some protective claim for refunds for our clients where we have told the IRS through a letter, Hey, we want you to keep the statute of limitations open for this. And there's some people like saying, ah, it doesn't qualify because there isn't any specific open litigation, but you know what? It's certainly better than nothing. Right. It's there is there is specific open litigation, right? There right. is, right? Yeah. 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 Provisions. yeah. That's the open yeah. litigation. It's it's in the courts. And Absolutely. It's, it's, it's doing well. <laughs> you gotta watch out for the naysayers, man. Like there's so many naysayers online. If you're reading the articles and stuff, there's always people saying, Hey, and like uh like even like penalties, people are afraid, oh, you you might get a lot of penalties, but we did the research and and all of the the top the most popular cannabis court cases, Harborside and the like, they they abated penalties for them. They said, hey, if you're used, they used a professional, they had a reasonable reason to like, to take their approach and they good got records. out of penalties. Yeah, and good records are extremely records. important. Like Nick mentioned earlier with the audits he's seen changes on, we've kind of seen it time and time again that not having good books and records just mm -hmm. as a foundation yeah. has been, we've seen the worst results uh, time yeah. and time again in the courts. So good records and consulting a competent professional uh, tends to be pretty good protection for the taxpayer. And then along with like disclosures, hopefully you're filing disclosures as well. So for, 20, for 2020, you might be able to get a protective claim for refund in. Um, and if it wasn't paid, you have two years. Well, go ahead from the date of payment, right, Jamie? Right. Yeah, two years right. from when it's paid no. or three years from when you filed, whichever is no. later. No, um, they didn't, there's they some didn't caveats. Pay. Yeah, there's yeah. some caveats like if you paid a little now and a little or a little while ago, a little bit, a little bit. If you're doing the two year thing for paying, you can only, the refund can only be up to the amount you paid in the last two years. Yeah. Um, some, so people there's some, owe, some people still owe for sure. There's people who have owe tons of money right yeah, now. Yeah, and that's a really great point. If you have not paid any, so we have a lot of people who we've encountered many clients who just haven't paid their taxes, right? So um, you may have filed the tax return, but you did not pay. <laughs> um, you can still file for like a reduction in your tax balance, but they won't refund you. Um, so it's kind of interesting, the, the different rules around the statute of limitations. Yeah. So then we have 2021 and 2022 that are still open for the most part. And, and so to, for, for potentially amending, we're going to have 2023. If you filed a conservative tax return, we'll be able to do that moving forward. Um, any concluding thoughts? And then uh, it is now 11. Uh, we could potentially open, like take another 10 minutes. Nick, do you have 10 minutes for some Q&A? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, any concluding thoughts? I'll say this. There are, so, you know, there's a lot of companies that have done, are doing this, right? Justin, as you said, um, and, you know, we see the IRS. I think, you know, you should assume that the IRS is going to challenge you. Um, that said, it doesn't always happen. We're seeing some inconsistencies out there. Um, you know, we've seen a number of clients get refunds. We've seen clients had liabilities wiped out. We had, we've had seen a couple of clients get, get audited. Right. Um, so we're not seeing a consistent across the, across the, the, you know, the bow. 
uh, approached by the IRS at all here. Um, I do think that notice, though, you know, you have to assume you're going to get audited. Um, and, and that's what I tell all my clients. Um, and if it still makes sense, then great. Um, but don't don't put your head in the sand and think that, you know, just because right. truly got its money back, you're going to that they're going to get your money back, too. And there isn't going to be a, a anything else. Right. So yeah. that's a wise way to go into it. Yeah, that's what I, I've been telling clients is like we don't really know right now. Like it's it, this is all new. And and so just assume the risk is high and yeah. and assume that an audit. And but if you again, if you've got good books and records, um, you you have a really good tax return prepared. This is what I'm telling my clients. Then you probably will just end up dealing with like a, a long audit process. Right. That's it's annoying to be an, audited. I mean, more than anything. Yeah. But if you're going to save twenty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars, yeah. And I want to, and I want to add know, to. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to add that for um, some of our clients that we have been applying, you know, maybe taking the position that uh, two eighty e should not apply. We still do four seventy one c at the same time. So we do both. We disclose yes. both both positions separately. Um, and that way, you know, the IRS can come back and they can say, ah, we don't agree the 280E piece and we can fall right back on a really, and a still, you know, aggressive and strong inventory position. Um, so that's really important to make sure you're covering the bases. We don't know the risks exactly, but in a way, you know, in some ways we can kind of quantify them, right? We know they can come back, they can say, uh, you understated your income and we're going to charge you penalties and interest on that mm -hmm. difference. Um, and, you know, hopefully the disclosures protect you from um, the, the greater of the penalties, which are substantial understatement penalties, right? The disclosures are intended to protect the taxpayer from that. Um, and oftentimes, as Justin said, we will we'll see penalties get waived um, in these situations, but the IRS cannot waive interest. So ultimately, if they come back, they disagree with your position, they change your return and recalculate tax you will be charged interest on the underpayment of your tax and, and they don't have the authority to waive that. So, right, it could, there's kind of a spectrum, right? The risk, the, the worst risk is they could disagree with maybe all of everything you did on the tax return, but that's probably pretty unlikely. And then the spectrum goes, you know, most likely is they might, you know, disagree or disallow your 280E position, recalculate tax and charge some interest. Um, if they never, for refunds, for amending for refunds, for example, um, if they didn't actually issue you the refund, then they'll just say no. <laughs> they'll probably just say no, right? Um, if they do issue you the refund, then again, they might charge interest on that refund. But um, the, it's, while we don't know for sure, as Justin said, so, you know, assume the risk is high, but it's pretty unlikely that the risk is, is anything greater than penalties and interest. Hey, Jamie, there's some questions in here. I was just looking through a little bit. Yeah. Dallas has a question about, about something. That I won't read it, but I want to just clarify something. If you're using the 471C method to get additional costs into recognition, look, 280E still applies, mm -hmm. right? So you can't, there's no, you can't, there's no deductions until 280E doesn't apply. Right. So this, so you're still putting everything that you want to get credit for into cost of goods sold, right? Exactly. That's important to understand. And then the other thing that's important to understand is you can't just write everything off at the end of the year. That's inconsistent with a method of putting things into cost of goods sold. You have to have a year end cost of goods sold that gets carried over to year two, right? That, that is a consistent accounting method. And it's very important that you follow that method. Now, look, when 471C first came out, a bunch of, a bunch of CPA cannabis CPAs took the position that now we can write off our ending inventory. That's a legitimate position under 471C as well, but that is not consistent with putting additional costs into cost of goods sold, right? And so it's sort of one or the other. If you want to take that, if you're, if you're taking a position of expanding cost of goods sold under 471C, that the, the writing off the year-end inventory is something that could be available once 280E doesn't apply, right? Once that happens, now we can get to a, a position like that. That might be the your 2024 return, right? But in the years when 280E applies, we need to be consistent with an inventory method of putting things into cost of goods sold. And that means year-end inventory carried over year two as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Yep. Yeah, on the chart of accounts, we put everything we're gonna deduct, deduct into cost of goods sold and we capitalize yeah, some of that inventory. Portion. Right, yeah, it's exactly. All, it's all, it's, we, we yeah, work and, and so that's a great point, Nick, just to also touch on that a little further. Um, we have seen people, different accountants and stuff who might do a really big adjusting journal entry at the end of the year, right? And they'll say everything that was below the line, you know, every, all their overhead expenses, we're just gonna reclassify them up to cost of goods sold. That's not, that's not really going to fly. That's not books and records matching. That's a tax adjustment at year end. So, so we really do recommend, you know, you know, adjust your chart of accounts, make all the accounts that you're hitting, put them up in cost of goods sold on your P and L make inventory adjustments, do all of that. So your position really is that your books and records do match the tax return. You don't want to Jamie, that's critical, right? That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's essential. It's essential. That is the, that's the position. Right. That is yeah. the position is that your books and records match. Right. So you don't want to be doing, you know, a, a big sweeping journal entry at year end. No, that's not going to really fly. I wouldn't recommend that. I recommend really adjusting everything. Make it all match. Make it all consistent. As Nick says, file that 3115, you know, do it right so that your position is strong. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that it says in the regulations is 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 that 471C is the method of accounting that is used in your day to day business. Mm -hmm. It specifically says it's not it's not the method it's not a tax method of accounting. Right. It is the actual method that you use in your day to day business. Yeah. And that's so. What is that? That is you 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 can't you, you can't you know journal you entry your, up yeah, at you the end of your tax, year. Your that's tax not, preparer right. throw in a journal entry. That's not day to day. No. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey Jamie, there's really something, something you gotta... in here about about some questions about rescheduling. Um, yeah. Look, rescheduling is medical, right? That that question is, oh, is it a medical thing? It is. <laughs> let's let's make let, schedule three is a medical thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it it enables the schedule three industry, which guess what that is? That's big pharma. It does nothing for adult use. Mm -hmm. Zero. Yeah. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if we're right on 280E going away when the HHS report came out, here's my question. Do we want rescheduling at all? If the only thing rescheduling did was get rid of 280E and that's already happened, are there any further benefits or is it all just exposure for our clients because now Big Pharma is going to jump in and start to sell Bubba Kush at Rite Aid, right? You know, um, I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's a good sort of rhetorical question for us to ask. Um, Nick, and, we should get on another, we'll get on another recorded video of, right? <laughs> of, of that, of the philosophical, uh, you know, our clients definitely should be wary of Schedule 3. The only thing that it does is it it, it gets rid of 280E. That's it. That's it. But then it might expose the industry to other uh, challenges, you know, more maybe more costly challenges. I think the THCA, the hemp right now, is really bad for the regulated market. We, that's a different conversation too, right? <laughs> I mean, we could go, we can go on and on to the challenges of the cannabis industry. Yeah. And so Dean right. asks, um, are you guys amending returns now back to 2020 since they're still open? And yes, Calix is amending some tax returns for clients that are open to yeah, it. We, we yeah. are, we are right now. I mean, if you've got clients that may have filed last minute, consider a protective claim for refund if you can't. If you can't amend their return, and um, and again, reach out to Nick for um, language to include in your tax returns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, guys. I think we I think we done did it. Uh, do we want to spend a little bit more time on questions? Oh, there we go. Hi, Nicole. Do you want to post the questions up and answer them, or? It looks like we kind of got most of them covered, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Someone asked about literature on 471C. No, we don't really have anything. I mean, we rec definitely recommend everybody reads the code, read the regulations. There are some articles out there that touch on it and why, um, you know, maybe the regulations aren't really valid and disallowing 471C. But there's not a lot out there because a lot of people are kind of afraid to, to kind of publicize that position. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a lot of just kind really, of really just this meeting is probably yeah. the most informative thing that you're going to find <laughs> on it. So, all right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you um, getting the word out there through Tax Practice Pro. 
Uh, thank you, everyone who attended this afternoon, and have a great afternoon. Yeah, thank you, thank you for Tax Practice Pro for their support of the cannabis industry for so yeah. so many years. Yeah, and I just wanted to say people can email if they've got other questions. Feel free. Hey, to hey Justin, them. I was in that. I was in that uh, that John Sheely uh, presentation in that ba that basement uh, of, the, really? of the hotel in Denver back oh, in 2014. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you weren't one of the speakers, though. I don't think, or were you? I, I was remember. not. I was not. Later on, John and I did a bunch of that together. But in that one, I was. I, even, I, was I probably didn't even know it, but you're probably the one who was like, "Hey, this is there's things that we can do here," you know. But at first, it was like there's nothing we can do, and then all of a sudden, it was like a round table of like, of how how do we do this? What are we gonna do? So it's good. <laughs> it's very good. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.